thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. And I'm going to talk about an issue that's probably the center of a lot of the discussion around here, which is how do we create a data transparent environment that's compatible with AI and human need, which is privacy and equity and lack of bias <coughs> and is ethical. I'm going to talk about that in the context of health, but the ideas apply across the spectrum of data friction and AI. The big question we want to talk about here is not about big data, but small data. The challenge that if in case of health, if many clinics and hospitals uh, and small primary facilities have a small set of data, how can they pool all their resources together so that they can train a much better algorithm, a much better AI system without exchanging raw patient data. And if you can achieve that, we still have to exchange some data, but without exchanging raw patient data. And if you can achieve that, then we can truly create an equitable computer system. The human problems and human bias is another factor. Or at least from a computing point of view, we can create an equitable solution. So my group at MIT uh, works on many areas, including computational health. Um, and we do want to think about not just on an individual scale, or organizational scale, or uh, a population scale, uh, but we also want to think about the other dimension, not just physical technologies like diagnostics and devices, or digital technologies like what we're talking about here, uh, using data science or machine learning, um, but also global technologies such as satellites, Google Street View, microfluidics, and so on, blockchain and so on. So let's come back to the main topic, which is how can we go from a world that was very patient-centric, in fact, doctors would see patients you know, in, a, in a private facility one as to one, uh, and about 30 years ago, a new team, new term emerged, hospitalist, but hospitals started emerging and doctors started affiliating themselves with the hospital, and so the hospital was responsible for their local community, to where we are now, where we are thinking at health as a population scale problem. <clears throat> but we want to go beyond the existing data and techniques such as devices and electronic health records and population health and remove the data friction and create a completely new capture and analysis framework. And there are three main concepts here. Health world, health data markets, and health OS, health operating system. So health world, of course, is a way to create a digital locker. Uh, I won't go into the detail. Health data market is a lot of concepts that we heard yesterday from our friends at uh, Niti Aayog and World Economic Forum. I think there's a session uh, coming up after this. And Health OS is a, a mechanism very much like the internet or the financial system uh, that creates a fundamental layer to deal with health data and create, you know, AI yeah, that's societally beneficial. So we're talking about invisible health data. Uh, and this small data, if we really want to use it for machine learning, then we have to worry about many issues. The data is distributed. We, of course, have to worry about patient privacy. It's very, very critical. There needs to be incentives for the small players to actually make it happen. They may not have any expertise in data science or machine learning, and the data itself may not be very good quality, may not have good labels, you know, uh, and there's a lot of data wrangling we have to do. In addition, many of these facilities uh, maybe off the grid, maybe there's very low compute power, very low bandwidth, and so on. So how can we achieve the goal of a really equitable data transparent uh, environment uh, in, in facilities uh, like this? Um, and the problem was to understand how can we train a, a, a solution that's globally useful, although we're using this highly segmented, highly siloed data uh, all over the place. Uh, and without exchanging raw patient data to avoid privacy uh, issues. So that's how we want to think about it. There's a server that want to achieve, you know, a global AI, and there are single or multiple clients who has all the data, but <coughs> the client is not allowed for some reason to share the data. So let me go to the technicality a little bit, just so that you know I think the conversation can be can have more depth uh, as we get into the panel. So there's basically four reasons why there's data friction. Uh, first of all, just the ease 
of, of sharing data could be a problem. Uh, and schemes like Yoshiman hopefully make a lot of that uh, underlying architecture easier. The second would be blockchain. What's the incentive for uh, what's the incentive for for uh, for these small entities to actually even do this? They have to spend resources to collect the data, have employees, they need compute resources. Why would they do it? So they need incentives uh, to do that, and that could be solved with blockchain. You need to trust the entity. Maybe it's a government entity, you might trust it, maybe it's a private player, maybe you may not trust it. So how can we validate the trust of this transaction, the trust of the individual who's receiving the data? At the same time, the server also needs to trust that it's coming from a uh, benevolent player and not a malicious player who's trying to, uh, who's trying to contaminate the environment uh, with adversarial attacks by sending data that can be corrupted, uh, you know, and so that the diagnosis of somewhere else could go completely wrong. Okay. So adversarial attacks is a major issue. Um, and even if these small players have, it's convenient, can use uh, incentives and trust the exchanging party, uh, there may still be regulation, whether it's privacy or HIPAA or the, you know, the promise you have made to your patients that could prevent you from, from doing that. So there are a lot of elements uh, in data friction. The probably three concepts I'll very briefly touch uh, that can solve this problem from a computational point of view. So the main message I want to get across is that so far we have been treating data sharing and privacy as two very opposing concepts. But in reality, at least from a technology point of view, those issues have disappeared. And we can start talking about achieving data privacy and sharing the same way. The ways, the same way you use your credit card uh, by sharing data or scheme being private about your financial information because of encryption. So the first concept is automated machine learning. Um, and as you can see, we're still not there yet. And automatic machine learning, when New York Times wrote about our group, they called it an AI building AI. Uh, I think that's a little bit of a clickbait article, uh, clickbait uh, title. Uh, but the interesting part about uh, machine learning now is that you can in fact create you know, more sophisticated teacher programs that can train many student programs. And they can create thousands of student programs and see which one of them is working the best and pick the winner and then use that for the task. So a lot of the machine learning that we talk about, hiring machine learning researchers and engineers, a lot of those needs will go away uh, and it's going to become extremely automated and extremely simple to use. Very much as you would use Excel or PowerPoint or you know, any program where most of the complexity is abstracted away. Uh, from you. Now, when it comes to uh, protection of the data, we talked about sharing of the data, we talked about protection of the data, the three broad schemes that you will come across. One is you anonymize the data, you know, just de-identify. Um, and um, we all know this is the worst way to create protection because if you just triangulate that with some other data sets, and right now you can buy thousands of data sets out there, uh, you know, you can completely crack the identity and through um, reduce the is the, the trust in the system. Uh, the second method commonly used is some kind of an obfuscation. The easiest one would be to aggregate, uh, or often you have to add some noise uh, to the data uh, so that you, can add, you cannot identify original, uh, original um, uh, information. A common example would be your GPS coordinate is often obfuscated by your app before it's sent to untrusted solutions, untrusted uh, products. And that does not protect you all the way, but so it's a good start. And uh, the other solution that you will see is just encryption. And this is probably the best way uh, to protect your data. The challenge is none of these three are compatible with machine learning. And that's the challenge we're facing. And that's why we're having this debate about the trade-off between privacy and benefits for the society. So uh, if, I, if you look at those schemes, anonymization, obfuscation, and encryption, as I said, uh, it may or may not be compatible with machine learning. You might have heard about phrases like homomorphic encryption or differential privacy and, and other buzzwords. Uh, and the way you can summarize all those ideas is that if you want to, uh, on the vertical axis, if you want to utilize that data, uh, there are multiple computational layers you have. The simplest layer would be on the bottom left, which is statistics. If you just want to statistics, less than, greater than, histogram, and so on, then in fact, turns out you can encrypt the data and still be able to perform those operations. 
Okay, so just remember to perform very simple operations that you would do in Excel, for example, you can encrypt and still do those operations. If you were to do inference, which is, hey, I have a photo and can I send it to you and tell me if this chest x-ray has pneumonia, that's just inference. Uh, and that can actually be also achieved by just obfuscating the data, adding some noise to the data. So that's the, that's the yellow dot. But what we really care about is being able to train models, which means I have x-rays of 10,000 patients, chest x-rays, and I want to create a new algorithm, a new technique to detect pneumonia. And to do that, you have to train the networks. And this kind of computation, at least right now, cannot be supported with obfuscation and encryption. So that's the challenge. And so my team at MIT has a method called uh, SMASH. Uh, there are other methods that others, you know, other teams have developed as well. And the key idea here is can you share wisdom without sharing raw data? Okay. The way to achieve a really good balance between privacy and societal benefits is to share wisdom without sharing raw data. And of course the wisdom is shared computationally as well without expressing any individual's thing. So if I want to learn about how do I figure out, how do I diagnose pneumonia in a chest x-ray, all the small clinics might have maybe a couple of hundred or maybe thousand chest x-rays where they can pool all their wisdom together so that a central system knows how to infer if a new chest x-ray comes in to diagnose whether it has pneumonia or not without ever having looked at a raw chest x-ray from any of the small clinics that are out there. That's the key. <clears throat> so the, the, some of the buzzwords you may have heard are differential privacy, which is obfuscating the data with more noise, or homomorphic encryption that allows you to do math or statistics over encrypted data. Right now it can mostly support basic mathematical operations like addition and multiplication, uh, but cannot do complicated, complicated, complicated tasks such as square roots uh, and inversions and, and things like that. Uh, fair data learning is the method promoted by Google, which is pretty interesting. And the idea there is straightforward. You go to create uh, small neural networks at all of the small clinics and ask them to simply send back the neural nets, which is the wisdom. Uh, and take an average of all those weights. So simply ask all the clinics to do their small, small operations, you know, bring the wisdom to a central location and take an average of all those weights. And that's federated learning. And the split learning, the method that my team has invented and others are working on similar ideas, is you actually ask all the small clinics to do their own small task. So we're splitting the networks and not merging the networks. And the splitting, it turns out, is really good for tasks like the ones we're talking about in health, education, transportation, livelihoods, and so on, the federated learning is a much better, much better method when you have things like small cell phones or small edge devices, and you have millions of them, and you want very tiny amounts of uh, data, tiny amounts of networks from, from each other. So as I said, in federated learning, you have a bunch of clients and a server, and you're simply taking a linear combination, some kind of a weighted combination uh, of those weights, uh, which is surprising that it works at all, uh, but in practice, it has been shown that this is actually a reasonable approach. So your Android and iOS phones are already doing this. You know, they're able to see your text message and they're able to see your images, although they haven't made a promise that your text messages, your photos are private, that you know, Apple or Google are not looking at it. Uh, at the same time, they're capturing the wisdom of all your text messages. So this is happening already. And the question is, how can we scale that to more complex systems? So, uh, without going into too much detail, things like differential privacy, homomorphic encryption, oblivious transfer, garbage circuits are the terms you will hear. <coughs> of course, we won't talk about it today. And they allow you to uh, share the wisdom uh, without, uh, uh, without leaking any data. But some of the existing techniques that are compatible with what we're talking about today could allow partial leakage. They could say a little bit about what the private data is, but without revealing raw data. That's out there. And of course, like learning that we have beats the federated learning, that's always a good thing. Um, and so to summarize, I think if you have to move towards a health world that can contribute to health data markets and to a health OS, an operating system that works across the health system, you know, we have to go well beyond the traditional electronic health records and population health. Um, and I talked about three methods that can really change it. 
we need automated machine learning so that even places that have very little compute resources and have no ML expertise can create algorithms that train on their own with no human intervention to exchange data between the small clinics and the central facility we need split learning so that we are not exchanging any private data whatsoever uh, no private raw data is exchanged and the third is we need incentives for the small players to actually exchange the data so we need a way for the server to have a negotiation with each of the client clinics and hospitals say hey I'm willing to pay 100 rupees for this one, 1,000 rupees for this one, or more, um, and take at the same time take care of the consideration that not all data is created equal. And of course, you want to evaluate how much, how many rupees should you pay for any data set without actually looking at the raw patient data. That's the key. So in our group, we are solving all those three problems, and I'm very excited to hear about the Health Data Market Initiative uh, from Niti Aayog and World Economic Forum.